Hello. Uh, while we're all seated, seating in this room now, there are approximately half a million juveniles sitting in some form of a detention facility around the United States. Out of that half a million, 3,000 of these kids will never see the light of day in a regular street because they are basically sentenced to life in prison. We have approximately 2.5 million Americans, our fellow American citizens, who are in prison. And we are the same country that have launched robotic missions a trillion miles away, and even quadrillion miles away if you look at Voyager. And we have sent robotic missions to the deepest, or manned missions to the deepest parts of the oceans. We are planning to send robotic missions to redirect asteroids. We are sending, preparing to send humans to Mars. We have privatization of space. And still, we seem to be content and allowing two and a half million fellow Americans to be languishing in prisons. Like one of our political leaders says, we got to know what the hell is going on here. This is untenable. The reason being, 25% of these 2.5 million individuals will go back to prison because of recidivism. And so what I want to do with you is to come along with me in a journey and to show you what, and this journey with me is going to take you not a short distance, but probably 4.5 million years, billion years. This is the age of the planet as a 12-month calendar made it easy for you to understand. On January 1, the Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago. You can just imagine the conditions on the Earth. It was extremely cataclysmic. It was not an oxygen-rich environment. Methane was there. It was extremely upheavals, volcanoes, everything. The Earth was being formed. Less than a billion years later, microbes come in February. Keep this in mind. 3.8 billion years ago, microbes come onto this earth. For a long time, there's nothing other than the first land animals show up in the oceans. And December 11th, and by December 27th, mammals. What about us? Where are the humans here? We don't show up until December 31, around 10 PM. That's 200,000 years ago. So during all this time between when the microbes came to this planet and when humans have come, they have completely got accustomed to the Earth. They have completely adapted to this environment. Not only that, these organisms have actually made it possible for many of the oxygen uh, organisms that live off oxygen. For example, you may have heard about your little uh, mitochondria that your science teacher talked to you about. How many of you have heard about mitochondria? Your science teacher may have told you that's the energy currency of the cell. That's where which makes the ATP molecules. Guess what? These bacteria, these organisms that survive on Earth would not have been able to survive. We will not be able to survive today without mitochondria having come into all of our cells because mitochondria reduces the oxygen toxicity. We would not be living in an oxygen-rich environment if it had not been for mitochondria. What your teacher may or may not have told you is that these little creatures or these little cell organelles are really primitive bacteria. What they may have told you, of which you probably may have been sleeping in your high school class, is that these mitochondria have DNA in them. We'll come back to this in a bit. Ladies and gentlemen, what you see in the front of you on your left is the very garden variety salmonella, the one that causes infections from your foodborne illnesses when you go to Taco Bell, excuse me, not Taco Bell, anybody else. <laughs> any restaurant, any fast food restaurant, you get sick. But what you see on your right is the same organism that have been inactivated by one of the most advanced technologies known to man, ionizing radiation. Inactivated means the cells will not multiply. But let me tell you, just 24 hours ago, two of my students in my lab told me, Dr. Pillai, we have had these bacteria, inactivated bacteria, stored with us for five years. And guess what? All of the metabolism is functional inside them. So these are bacterial cells that have been inactivated. They will never multiply. 
but they are extremely capable of undergoing all the physiological functions inside them. So these bacterial cells have adapted themselves to the most extreme environments, whether it's high pressure, high temperature, etc. They are far more adapted than ever humans could be. And now putting numbers into perspective, so we were Johnny come lately anyways on this planet. We were the last to the party. Not only that, if you look at the world's population, it's 7 billion people total. There are probably 10 billion organisms in your front two teeth. Keep that in mind. Who is the contaminant here? <laughs> you know, when we talk about microbial contaminants, we see all these newspaper reports. You know what the bacteria are saying? You know, Get real, dude. You know, just zip it. You guys are in the con you are the contaminants. We are not the contaminants. These numbers, so we have been completely colonized by these bacteria. There are trillions of bacteria all around us. There are trillions of bacteria inside us. It's all over us, within the air, in the soil, in the seeds that you had. They obviously have to be doing something. So many years ago, <laughs> I started a website called 1 800 God Runs because I wanted to get an inventory of diarrheal diseases in the United States and worldwide. You know, it was not funded. One of the lines would say that it's an unfunded project. Well, the, pro the website didn't take off because I had difficulty translating diarrhea into all the na country, all the languages around the world. Well, that was the least of the problems. But what it told me was that we were spending so much of precious uh, public health monies to try to deal with infectious diseases, whether it's diarrheal diseases or any other infectious diseases, without really understanding who we are playing against. So, we st and you can see the, f uh, the fresh fruit industry, the food industry, does a lot of things. They start s spending cleaners to wash your vegetables. You start buying cleaners to wash your toilets. Actually, if you look in your own household, there are probably more cleaners in your toilet area, in your toilet than in your kitchen sink. And if you were an alien coming into this earth on a UFO, you would drink out of the toilet bowl of crap and crap in your uh, kitchen sink. <laughs> so we may try to spray, but all we are trying to do is basically end up praying that we are not being exposed. But ladies and gentlemen, you're totally exposed to these organisms. So whatever you try to do, remember, resistance is futile. Not only are we totally inept at surviving this earth, because we only have a 200 year life history. We are outnumbered by organisms. We have mitochondria in our cells, which is responsible for so many of our vital activities. These viruses, for example, the endogenous retroviruses, have actually also got itself into our genome. Almost 8% of our genome is filled with these retroviruses. And guess what? If there are no retroviruses, there would be no babies. Because retroviruses, these endogenous retroviruses, are responsible for producing the most important protein in the placenta. So our very being is controlled by microorganisms. So because of all of our tremendous advances in technologies, et cetera, we have started to understand them. It started out with the microgenome project. We now have the microbiome project. We know that these organisms are filled, they are filled with organisms, whether it's the inner lobe, outer lobe, wherever you look. So really, I'm not Suresh Pillai. I probably should be Toxoplasma Gandhi, and you, sir, should be actually Neisseria gonorrhea because you're more bacteria than human. <laughs> because there are 10 bacterial cells for every human cell on your body. And not only that, these organisms keep changing from the time you're born to the time you become a teenager to the time you're an adult and the time you become a senior citizen. They keep changing. We did some work about seven, eight years ago where we showed that on, an, on a daily basis, on an average, whether you drink a glass of water or a cup of coffee, we are ingesting about 5,000 microbial DNA sequences on an average. Every day, every meal or every item that we put into the mouth, about 5,000 microbial sequences. They obviously have to do something. There's something is going on. So, so pretty much you can imagine that this was like we were living in a black hole. We never had any understanding of all of this. 
And then one day, lo and behold, we open the window with all of these omics technologies, and it's a fantastic scenery. Beautiful to stare at, makes great publications. But the tough part is trying to understand what it all means, making all this uh, with these connections between the omics and the uh, uh, biotechnology, with the genomics, transcriptomics, et cetera. These are all extremely challenging. In fact, this whole field has created new jobs, new businesses with uh, big data analytics, et cetera. This is to make head of sense or tail of what it does between the humans and the host. So many years ago, we started working on cell-to-cell -cell signaling, understanding what is happening between these bacterial cells. There are these auto-inducer molecules. These molecules are what control the interaction between bacterial cells. They are actually, when they are in small in numbers, they produce a, less, less, a lot less auto-inducer molecules, but these molecules are very much responsible for a number of host and uh, bacterial interactions, so that the bacteria in your GI tract they produce these signaling molecules. They interact with your brain through the vagus nerve. And this is not something spectacular. If you were Dory, you would have seen this. <laughs> because the light organ on the fish, on the angle of fish, is actually bacterial cells producing the light because the fish told the bacteria to produce the light so that it can capture the prey. And you can imagine that the reverse is also happening, which is just that we have not made good Disney movies out of it. So this gut-brain axis through, through the vagus nerve is extremely important. It controls a number of functions. We now know from the last uh, dozen or so years, they control all sorts of manifestations like autism, uh, personality disorders, suicidal thoughts, um, a variety of these factors. But what is also very intriguing is that coming back to this mitochondria, one in 2,500 people actually suffer from mitochondrial disease. And I mentioned about the DNA in the mitochondria. If you have a DNA mutation in the mitochondria, the immediate symptom is mental retardation and tremendous mental disorders. Significant amounts of variety of spectrum of disorders come from um, this mitochondrial DNA mutation. We don't look at prisoners and find out how many of them have mitochondrial DNA defects. So talking about mental disorders, if you look at Toxoplasma gondii, this is a protozoan parasite that if uh, about 20% of the US population is, is affected by it. In women, it can cause abortions and stillbirth and a variety of problems. In males, normal adult males, it doesn't, doesn't have such dramatic effects, but the bigger effects is that it has a loss of sexual appetite, a loss of, um, uh, in fact, a number of uh, decisions, moral decisions, the capacity to make moral decisions are tremendously diminished. In women, it's opposite in that you actually have a sense of super e uh, IQ and sexual promiscuity. But what is very important, this protozoan can only have sexual reproduction inside the feline. This protozoan will get into the mouse. Mice are programmed to avoid the cats, but it will, in, when the mice are actually infected by this organism, it actually goes towards the cat so that the cat can eat it and the protozoan can get into the feline. This is an ultimate case of mind control. So the same way with uh, horses, with Borna disease virus, something similar to the mad cow disease. But people who have Borna disease virus, children who have grown up with horses, have manic depression. Uh, significant manic and chronic depression, acute depression, a lot of suicides has been associated with it. Similarly with, with the uh, Lyme disease, with Borrelia. People who have been infected with Borrelia have tremendous aggressive behavior. They are extremely sensitive to odors. They are extremely sensitive to bright light. So imagine if, you're if you have the Lyme disease and you're pulled over by a policeman and he flashes a light at your face, how you're going to react. There are instances of children or instead of a soccer mom who has actually been uh, super aggressive with a policeman because he's shown a light at her face in, a, in the middle of a traffic stop. There's a lot of papers that are coming out on this, but as you can imagine, this is very controversial. There's an instance of cat scratch disease, a trucker who came into work and started becoming extremely belligerent. People thought he was on drugs. He was arrested, fortunately for him, his doctor diagnosed him to have the cat scratch disease to the point that he could not recognize faces. And he was put away into the prison system because of a microbial infection. So there's a lot of 
great articles coming out in Scientific American where the protozoa could be controlling your brain, whether the bacteria in your gut is actually controlling mental health. And this is tantalizing. This is controversial because you can imagine the prison system is the most, one of the most uh, fast-growing industries in the United States. There are a lot of vested interests to not question some of these issues. So what, what I want to point out here is that around 40 to 50 percent of individuals in the prison system, whether it is a federal prison, a state prison, or a local prison, they have mental disorders. And if you look at the symptoms of these mental disorders, if I just take away the comment about um, uh, the prison system and put bacterial uh, infections, they are pretty much ditto. The same uh, symptoms that you see in mental, uh, mental health have it. And if you look at people who have uh, recidivism, 25% commit who have mental health commit go back into the prison. That matches what we see in the United States. 25% of people who are in prison go back. And the people who are involved in crime, etc., you can see they're all involved in having mental health. The, the, unfortunately, the prison system is not equipped to deal with these issues. How often do you see a prison system saying, well, you know, it's, I think it's his diet, or I think it's his gut microbiome, let's change the diet, let's give him something. We don't. We, as a society, we seem to have lost our appetite to deal with these bigger issues. Put them away, throw the keys away. So these are some of the mental health symptoms. If you look, as I mentioned, if you put this across Bartonella or Lyme disease or Toxoplasma, they match up 100% to these, to these symptoms. But we never go, we never take the time to dissect it down. So what is it that we do in my lab? We are trying to change the microbiome of animal species, starting out with chickens as a, as a, as a model system, to understand whether we can control behavior. We want to do a variety of technologies, actual microbiome transplantation into, into, the, new, into the eggs, uh, uh, taking inactivated organisms, stimulating the immune system in the gut, and trying to change a microbiome towards something that can affect behavior. We have, uh, so this is, this is the work that we are trying to do. And to match up with all of this, the goal is, if you remember in 1990s, there was a project by, started by Barry Sheck called the Innocence Project where he started using DNA testing to get people out of death row and to get people out of the, out of the criminal system. And he's got about 350 people off of these sort of crimes and out of these false acquisitions. So what we are trying to do in my lab is something like microbial innocence. We want to use science and technology to understand, to question the paradigms, challenge the dogmas, we are going to face a lot of headwind. We are going to face a lot of naysayers who, who don't believe this. But I just want to mention that to all the young students here and those who are watching us, whether you're in high school or in middle school or in college or a full-time scientist, please do not allow a mind to go to waste. Because this is each one of the 2.5 million Americans who are in prison. We can do far better than what we're doing today. Thank you.